In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear sisters and brothers in Christ, we have a tradition here at Prince of Peace that I think exists in nearly every Lutheran church and a lot of other Christian churches as well. You all already participated in it this morning, and we do it here every week, and that's this. We stand to hear the reading of the Gospel, the, the third scripture reading that we just heard from John chapter 3. And it's always one of the Gospels, one of the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And this tradition of standing to hear the Gospel was first found written in a text that dates back to like 200 A.D. It was in this text called the Didascalia Apostolorum, which is a Latin phrase that means the teachings of the Apostle. And what those writings contain was not so much new doctrine or teachings as much as how the Apostles and the earliest Christians put the teachings of Jesus into practice. What are the things that they did out in the world and in, inside the worship service that showed they took these words of God to heart? So, for example, um, it, it reads in there that the apostles themselves laid down the rule that in the worship service, whenever scripture was read, it should be read from an elevated platform, meaning that they wanted to give the words of God prominence, as opposed to kind of the, the words of man or really anybody else. And this is kind of what has led into the tradition of having a pulpit or a lectern or something elevated from which you read the Word of God and you preach. The writing would go on to say also this, that at the conclusion of all the scriptures, all of the readings on Sunday morning, the gospel shall be read last as being the seal of all scriptures, and let the people listen to it standing upon their feet, because it is good tidings of the redemption of all people. So for 1800 or more years on Sunday morning, somewhere in the world, Christians have been standing to hear the reading from one of those four books. Standing to hear the words and works of Jesus, the fulfillment of all the scriptures, which is the good tidings, the good news, or the gospel of salvation and redemption of all people. Now the question is, what are those words of Jesus? Which words are his? Some of you probably have a red letter Bible uh, edition at home. You know, that's the one when you, you get into specifically the, the Gospels. And the words that Jesus spoke are written in red font, and all the other words around them are written in black font. And if you go home and you open up your red letter edition of the Bible, the well-known words that we just heard from John chapter 3, verse 16, will be written in red. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. The problem is, I'm not so sure that Jesus actually spoke those words. Now, that doesn't mean they're not important. It doesn't mean that they're not powerful or comforting or wonderful or divinely inspired or God-given or any of those things. And just so that we're all clear, I'm not saying that John 3.16 should not be in your Bible. I'm just not so sure that Jesus is the one who actually spoke that verse. And there are a couple of clues that I think kind of get you there. First, Jesus does not typically refer to God as God. Why is that? Well, because Jesus has such a close and intimate and personal relationship with God that he almost always refers to him as his Father. Second, Jesus does not normally refer to himself as God's one and only Son. He actually calls himself what we heard last week and in the opening verses of our text this morning, the Son of Man. So, but you know who does call Jesus God's one and only, God's one and only Son? John does. 
The guy who wrote this gospel, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, you read throughout John's gospel, and John is repeat, repeatedly calling Jesus God's one and only. I'm not so sure that this is Jesus talking, which makes this a little awkward, because modern Christians have said that John 3.16 is sort of like the definitive Christian statement. It's given nicknames, like it is the gospel in a nutshell, and that's fine, and it can remain all of those things to all of those people. I'm just not so sure that it is the verse that, like, for example, the Old Testament Christians would have chosen. Because, you know, when Old Testament Christians chose like their John 3.16 Old Testament verse, you, you know what they chose? When, when they were going to pick words that they were going to put on their coffee mugs and on bumper stickers and on their Facebook posts, they chose words that were God's own self-revelation in His own words. They chose words that were God talking about Himself. For example, Exodus chapter 34. God says, the Lord, the Lord, here's who I am, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. You see, when Old Testament Christians chose words that were going to define their faith, we're going to define their God. They chose words where God is talking about himself. And I think it's strange that we, as New Testament Christians, didn't do that. Especially because right next door to John chapter 3, verse 16, Jesus does. He gives us his self-revelation in his own words. And yet I get it, because most modern Christians don't even know those verses right before John 3, 16 even exist, let alone what they mean. And it's hard to pinpoint exactly when did John 3, 16 become John 3, 16. But I think there are some things that kind of give us some clues as to when, at least in our modern culture, it kind of took on what it has become. If you look up John 3.16's Wikipedia page, it has its own Wikipedia page, for example. Near the bottom of the page, the last section is entitled Influences, describing the various ways that John 3.16 has been used to influence modern culture. And there in the paragraph, it, had, it references former quarterback Tim Tebow. Do you remember this story? He won the 2009 BCS National Championship game with the words John 3.16 written on his eye black, making them the most searched words for a 24-hour period that followed. Over 90 million people Googled John 3.16. It gets better. Three years to the day later, January 8th, 2012, Tim Tebow played in his first NFL playoff game, a game that he was supposed to lose, and yet he won. And in winning, he threw, for you guessed it, 316 yards, averaging 31.6 yards per pass. And at the end of the game, the television ratings were 31.6. ESPN even did a story on this, quoting John 3.16, and when one of the reporters mentioned it to a high-up NFL executive, he said, are you kidding me? I might have to think about converting. Now, kudos to Tim Tebow for using his platform to share and make known John 3.16. At the same time, can we admit that it's a little strange, awkward, should make us a little uncomfortable that John 3.16, the way that it has influenced the world, is that it is tied and connected to winning football games. Actually, it's more than a little strange, it's really strange. 
Because what John ties, John 3.16 to, is the antithesis of winning football games. What John ties it to, and Jesus ties it to, is exactly the opposite. John shows this with one little word. He doesn't say, God so loved the world. He says, for God so loved the world. And no matter how many times you put that verse on a t-shirt or behind a hashtag, that little for is going to give you the what for until you understand what the for is for. What I mean to say is this. You cannot understand John 3.16 unless and until you understand John 3.14 and 15. It's actually impossible. You see, John isn't going to let you try to understand what the love of God looks like apart from the way that Jesus, God's one and only Son, tells you it looks like. And you know what Jesus says the love of God looks like? It looks like a snake put up on top of a pole out in the middle of the wilderness. That's what the love of God in the world looks like. Which is why it totally makes sense that people would much prefer to tie John Fix 316 to winning football games and TV ratings. But John doesn't, and neither does Jesus. Theologically, and contextually, and texturally, they both tie John 316 to a snake on a pole in the wilderness. Jesus says, the love of God looks like the snake that Moses lifted up and put on a pole. And if you think that sounds a little disturbing and uncomfortable, you're right on both accounts. Because sin and its effects always are. But we heard the story in our first scripture reading from Numbers chapter 21. The people of Israel are out in the wilderness, and they started making these awful accusations against God. It wasn't the first time. In fact, they've done it multiple times. They said things like this. God, why did you bring us out of slavery in Egypt just so that we would die in the wilderness? And i got to tell you, if you're ever looking for a way to break God's holy heart, if you want to make him both sad and mad at the same time, I don't know that you can do it in any better or quicker way than to call God a murderous thug. To tell him that he doesn't care about you. Tell him that he doesn't love you and that he's the reason why your life is so miserable. Tell him that. Because that's what the Israelites did and God sent them venomous snakes. And then the people started dying. Until... Until Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And when anyone who was bitten by a snake looked at the bronze snake, they lived. The thing that got them unbitten was to look at the thing that had bitten them. The anti-venom was looking and believing that the venom coursing through their veins was going to leave them and land someplace else, that it was going to be put up on that pole. And Jesus says, I'm just like that. In fact, he uses the word just as that, that when people suffering in the wilderness of this world who have poison and pain in their veins look at him, he's the antidote. That when people's lives are snake-bitten, they get unbitten by believing that Jesus took all the bites. Think about it. If I were to go around this morning and ask all of you the question, what times in life is it most difficult to see and believe in the love of God? We would probably use a couple different words to describe it, but we would all essentially give the exact same answer, and we would do it without even thinking. When is it most difficult to see and believe in the love of God in my life? Well, it's when things go wrong. It's when I'm lost, when I'm hurt, when I'm alone, when I fail. It's most difficult to believe in God's love when snakes come into our lives. 
And we give those answers not because we have a poor understanding of God. It's not because we're terrible theologians. It's because we actually kind of get it. We know what life should look like if everything between us and God was good. When you get married and you want to have kids, you think, well, we should just be able to have as many kids as we want. And then all of a sudden you can't. Or that your life should be totally just enveloped with love, like all the time. And then you wake up one day and realize you're alone. You're single and you don't want to be. Or you're married and you're unhappy. You think that your life should experience success after success after success. And what happens? Failure. Rejection. Unemployment. Crippling debt. You expect that you're going to be healthy. That you will age gracefully and painlessly. And then you're diagnosed. You think that we should all live forever. Or at least to the ripe old age. And then we go to a funeral of someone who didn't. Or even more earth shattering, we start dying ourselves. And somewhere deep down, we get it. We know that something is not right, that there's this curse between us and God, that we've been snake bitten by sin and death, and it's real. It's as real as the hospitals that we visit. It's as real as the caskets that we close. It's as real as the tears that we shed. That this is the wilderness of your life. And when you're lying down in the dust and you're feeling the poison of disease, that toxicity coursing through your veins, and you're looking around your life, you start to ask yourself that same question that the Israelites repeatedly asked of God. God, did you bring me out to this wilderness of a life just to die? You start looking around your life, and all you see is tragedy, pain, loss, and you, you start thinking, does God really love this little piece of the world called me? Because it sure doesn't look like it. That's why Jesus gave you something else to look at. This is why Jesus wasn't crucified off somewhere in a corner. Jesus wasn't crucified in some back room where nobody else could see. He was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem, and the whole world saw it. The world will think what it wants about Jesus, but you have to admit he was very successful in this regard. Everybody saw him die. It's a historical fact. You know this, I know this, the whole world knows this, secular people know this, unbelievers know this, Christians know this, everybody knows this. Why? Because Jesus was lifted up. He was literally lifted up so that everyone could see him die. This is why Moses put the snake on a pole. So that everyone who was bitten could see it. But you also have to understand this, and I think this is a key for today, that Jesus wasn't just lifted up literally. When he says he's being lifted up, he's not here just giving you a, a different way to think about his death. He's talking about it theologically as a, a matter of importance. Jesus is saying, my death is God's billboard. He's saying, my death is the thing that you have to know. It's the thing that you have to live, lift up above everything else that you know about me. And that's significant. You see, when it comes to Jesus' self-revelation about who he is and what he's come to do, he doesn't say the thing I want you to know is that, you know, just as Moses in the plagues turned water into blood, so I also will turn water into wine. Jesus doesn't say, you know, just as the Israelites were fed for 40 years with manna and quail miraculously, I also will feed over 5,000 people miraculously just using bread and fish. No, those are not the comparisons Jesus makes. 
Jesus says, the main thing that you have got to know about me is my cross. Which means that you cannot see the love of God fully until you see the love of God in Jesus on the cross. Which means that you do not see the love of God fully when Team Tebow and your team win the big game. It means that you do not see the love of God fully when you defy all odds and experience a miraculous recovery. You do not see the love of God fully when you land that lucrative job promotion or if you enjoy the most incredible family life. You can only see the love of God rightly. You can only see the love of God fully when you see the God of your sin. And the God of your death, and the God of your tragedy, and your loss, and your depression, and your addiction, and your loneliness, and your pain, and your grief. That's why God put on, that's what God put on a pole for all to see. This truth that Jesus wanted you to see your every curse your every last snake bite was put and inflicted on him. He wanted you to see that Jesus was given for your sin, that he was given into your death, that he carried all of your loss, that that is in fact how God so loved the world, that that is what Jesus was given to he wanted you to see that when the snake bites happen in life, when you've got the guilt of sin plaguing your conscience, when you've got the toxicity of disease coursing through your veins, you can look at him so that you can see he absorbed all of it for you. Jesus is not a God above that. He is a God that wants to be found in that. He is not a God that is removed from that. He is a God who was given just for that. He is not a God who is uncaring about the pain in your life. He is the God who has carried all of your pain in his life. Jesus is the antidote to all of the poison in your life. Jesus is the anti-venom for all of the snake bites. He is the one who forgives all of your sins and defeats the final enemy, which is your death. And you don't have to take my words for it. Take Jesus' words for it. That's what he said in his own supreme self-revelation in his own words. And he not only said it, he did it. And that is historically documented for the entire world to see. He was lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And John not only heard Jesus say that, he saw Jesus do it. And when Jesus died, the Holy Spirit poured John 3.16 into John's heart, giving us these most beautiful words. These words that are so beautiful and so rich that we treasure them almost above and maybe even above all other words today. And they are the words that are worth every one of those 90 million hits that Tim Tebow got them. They're worth every t-shirt and bumper sticker and billboard they've ever been printed on. They're worth every life that was cut down early for preaching them. Every friendship that was ended because you held on to them. Every awkward family gathering because you just had to share them. Because when you understand that Jesus is not just the God of your success, that he's not just the God of your best, but that he is actually the God of your worst, then, then you see the love of God right and more fully. And then what else can you write except for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. 
And when you hear those words, despite the fact that you see so much pain and loss in your life, you can still believe. Because although before, you could honestly ask yourself, does God really love this little part of the world called me? Now you can look out over the landscape of your entire life, and when you see a cross lifted high above it all, the question gets answered once and for all. And you have to say to yourself, God absolutely does love me. Because he does. And that, my friends, is the point. That you would see Jesus lifted up on a cross for you and believe. And that by believing, you would have everlasting life in his name. God grant that for you today and always. Amen.